Okay, Arnaud. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, David, first for uh, the invitation and uh, for the presentation. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to, to give this talk. It's been a while. Uh, I mean, it's been some time I haven't been outside of Australia, so it's always a nice opportunity you know, to, to talk outside from, from the continent uh, on the North Hemisphere, for example. And um, yeah, so I'd like to talk today about the uh, beautiful technology that uh, Von Jones um, left us uh, not so not a while ago, actually. Uh, the first preprint about it is from 2014, and the first published paper from 2017. So I try to talk a bit about uh, that today. Um, yeah, perhaps before I start, let me do just a little plan of what I, I think I'm going to do. I may shut down my camera because people are streaming a lot in Australia at about 8 p.m. So I'm afraid the connection may be not very, may be stable. I put it back uh, at the end of the talk. Let me see. Okay. All right. So what's the plan of today? Um, yeah, and also before I start, uh, I should mention I did like a a PhD uh, joint between Anjay Zouk in Paris and Von Jones in Berkeley. And uh, Anjay is actually uh, one of the participants right now, one of the yeah, auditors. Uh, yeah, so what's the plan of today? Uh, well, first, I want just to tell one story, uh, which is how was related um, how are related subfactors? TFT, and there are a lot of interaction and why Thompson enter in the play, the group of Richard Thompson. Why is it there? What was the connection originally? Uh, second, I want to give a bit of background about the Thompson groups. Okay, so I'm not going to be very technical, but I just want to give you an idea what kind of mathematical structure it is and why is it in, uh, interesting. And third, I want to talk about uh, the title about Jones action of groups and give you some application. Application example. So that's the plan for uh, today. Okay, so so let's start. All right. So this is one side that is not uh, you know completely in LaTeX. Um, so what is it about? So from the very beginning, there's been very close relationship between John subfactor theory, that is this big box that I, I put on the left. Okay and conformal field theory. So if I zoom in, yeah, I, I just write CFT, but it's all, always for conformal field theory. And there've been some, um, so when I say conformal field theory here, of course, there's a enormous literature, but the, the, way, the mathematical structure I want to think about conformal field theory is some Carroll uh, conformal field theory, a la, a la a Kassler, Doppler, a Robert, and there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of main, amazing work in that direction. For example, uh, pioneered by David Evans, Yashuka Waigashi, Roberto Longo, and many others that I probably, I forgot, but um, um, the point is that on the left-hand side, you have this uh, inclusion of the strong subfactor that is, you could say, purely from mathematics that are driven from physics. But um, the right hand side is more like in the physics world. And it has been shown that from any CFT, you can associate its subfactor. So that was done by uh, Longo and Rerun in 95. And 
a lot of further interaction have been uh, proved to exist as well. So you have one direction and you have a way back. So for particular examples. So for certain factors, you can reconstruct some conformal field theory, but you don't have a systematic reconstruction. And so the whole, the whole theory and the whole topic of this talk has been um, arised by this general question of von Jones, which is, does every subfactor have something to do with the conformal field theory? And this is also philosophically very, very important because it is asking if any of those objects called subfactors, do they actually have a physical meaning? And so we'll see that, um, we'll see a bit more about that uh, later. Maybe let me give you a, a little bit more detail. So, so what is a subfactor? Well, so subfactors is a theory that was uh, the modern theory of subfactors was initiated by Jones uh, around the 80s. Okay. There is like a famous article from 83, Index for Subfactors. And the subfactors is inclusion of von Neumann algebra. Okay. I don't give you all the details, but they are very nice von Neumann algebra. They are type to one factor. Mm. So you have one of it's for the algebra inside the other, okay. And you don't really care in general about the isomorphy type of N and M. What you really want to understand is how sit N inside the bigger for the algebra M. And so this inclusion can encode a lot of different structures, okay. such as groups, but also quantum groups, and you have other structures. And this other is really the, this exotic subfactor. So, so for example, they were like a famous subfactor due to a group. Turns out that it was actually coming from quantum group that was formed later, but they're like other cousins of this high group subfactor that are truly exotic. And uh, until today, it is not known if they come from quantum groups. So all of this is to tell you that they are very exotic structure and very interesting structure from the representation theoretical point of view. And on the right hand side, what do you have? You have something that looks also, that looks quite different. Well, you have, um, a net of phenomena, but so what do you have? You have like, let's say a space time, which is here a circle. So the circle is a space time. <coughs> and, and to any region of this space time, let's say an interval, you can associate an algebra of observable. So this is an algebra of observable. Okay. And it is again a fundamental algebra. And on top of that, what you have, you have a very nice action of a large group, the, the positive diffeomorphism of the circle. So it is just asking that is just um, oh, uh, acting on your space time. Okay. It must act, of course, in, in a very nice way. So that's what I call here uh, a conformal field theory. So two very, um, two lands that looks a bit different a priori, but in fact, they, they share a lot of uh, similarities. And for example, the representation theory of a conformal uh, net of a conformal field theory is very similar to the representation theory of a subfactor. Okay. It's a very nice uh, tensor category. And so, as I say, you can go from the right to the left, but from the left to the right, it is much more tricky. There are some case by case uh, construction, all right? There's been a lot of work on that. Um, yeah, there are too many names to, to cite here. Uh, but 
the point is that the most interesting subfactor, like the very exotic one, it is completely unknown if you can come back and build the CFP. Here, if I would like to have a bigger picture, I should say also that there are connections with vertex operator algebra. I could say that it cannot fit in between, and there are some interaction both ways as well. And same thing, it is very hard to, to take those very exotic subfactors and construct some vertex operator algebra. So Von Jones has been trying during many, many years to, to find a systematic reconstruction for, that will work for any subfactor. Okay. You give me a subfactor and you want to, to build a CFD from that. And here is one of his last attempts. Well, I'm not going to give you the details, but uh, the last attempt, um, constructed something quite similar than a conformal net. So here is really the path that he tried to, did, to do. And at some point, he was like quite close to a CFT, but he drift away and land somewhere else. And he land uh, whoop, in a place that is quite different, in fact. So you still have a circle, you can still associate an algebra of, of observable from any interval, okay? So you still have this collection of algebras of observable. Mm. Although now you have a much smaller group of symmetry, okay? Or very different kind of symmetry, I should say. And this group of symmetry is nothing else than the Thompson group T. Okay. So I will, I will explain a bit later what it is. But what should be understood is that here, this is rather discrete what's going on. While here, this is very really continuous. Okay. So you have very continuous structure uh, when you deal with subfactors or with um, conformal P theory. But when you in this new box right here, this purple box, things are rather discontinuous and discrete. Okay. I will see that, for example, the Thomson group is just a countable group. Okay. That's like a continuous group, very far from a Lie group or something like that. And from that, uh, John actually deduced a new way to build action. Okay. That I'm calling Jones technology. So it's really new way to, to build action. And I should say a practical way. That's something that I should emphasize a lot. This is this Jones technology is extremely um, concrete. Okay. You can really do computation, prove things with that. Yeah. And from this technology, you have two kinds of applications, you have a lot of kind of applications, I should say. And uh, some spectacular one, I mean, some very intriguing ones so far in knot theory. So you have some new knot invariant, actually, not only. But what I want to focus today on is more about application in group theory. Okay, so that's something I want to, to talk about today. This talk will be about that. Okay. All right, so this is kind of the, the big picture on how was discovered this new technology, but what I'm going to do today is really stay here. But we should not forget that this new technology for constructing actions and it gives you nice application in group theory came from very quantum mathematics, if you want. It really came from uh, John subfactor theory. All right. Any question about that, or should I just go on? Hmm. Okay. Well, let's continue. So let me discuss a little bit about uh, the group of Richard Thompson. 
So these are groups that uh, were found uh, in the 60s. And in fact, they were found independently by uh, several groups of people in different fields of mathematics. I'm just going to follow one description of them. Yeah. And here, uh, be careful that there are several famous uh, mathematicians called Thompson, and several of them are in group theory. And for example, there's a, a famous, I believe, a sporadic simple uh, finite group from another Thompson. So this is not the same one. Okay, so this is from Richard Thompson. So this is three groups, F, T, and V. So what is F? Well, it's the group of all homeomorphism of the unit intervals that are piecewise linear, okay? There are finitely many breakpoints that arrive at dyadic rational, and all the slopes are power of two. So here is the graph of a typical example of an element of the Thomson group. Okay, so that's, that's the graph right here. And how do you obtain such an element? Well, you take zero one, you perform a certain partition of it, you see, with my, uh, my black dots. These partitions are kind of special, they are called standard dyadic partition. Well, let me not give all the details. So you, you choose two partitions. And then you just find the only, uh, the unique uh, piecewise linear map that goes from the first to the second, and that will be, uh, um, that will send zero to zero and one to one. Okay. So in fact, any element of Thompson group S can be characterized by two partitions. And you can also transform this partition into trees if you want. These trees encode the same thing than your partition. I'm not giving all the details, but um, I think it's quite, um, you, can, uh, you can trust me that, uh, yeah, like one element like that is just uh, characterized by a pair of feet. Okay. All right, and so you end up with F that is a, a countable, countable group. And you have two uh, larger groups uh, that's the cousin of our Thomson group F, that are Thomson group T and V. T is basically the same, but you don't necessarily send zero to zero and one to one. Okay? So you allow, if you want, a cyclic permutation of the interval, okay? if you think in terms of partition. And so instead of getting homeomorphism of the unit interval, you get homeomorphism of the circuit. Now you could do any partition also of the interval, right? And you will get something much more discontinued. But I still give you a group, that is Thompson group B, the larger one. Uh, but now you no longer act on um, the circle, you act on the counter space, okay. right? So if you want to act by homeomorphism, you need to go through the counter space. And why is the cantor space? Well, here, in fact, you're going to see this cantor as the boundary of the infinite um, two regular tree. OK. So here you have trees. And you know, uh, it's not a surprise that you can act uh, you know, something at come from a tree. Okay, so these are the three group of, uh, of Thomson, F, T, and V. And uh, in fact, they have extremely, they, they are exceptional, exceptional among groups. So let me explain uh, why. So what is amazing is that they, they are, in fact, the first examples of infinite Finitely presented simple groups. Okay. So F is not uh, simple. It has like uh, abelianization is uh, this square, but if you take his, um, uh, his derived group, it's simple. T is simple, V is, is also simple. So 
So we have this, this fact that, you know, first uh, simple groups with nice properties. Another exceptional property is that it's a group with a um, very strong finiteness property. Okay. So it's actually the first example of something that is torsion free, so in some signal trivial, infinite dimensional groups of type F infinity. So here it means that it has a very um, special classifying space. Okay, you can find a classifying space uh, with a very nice CW complex. Okay. And that was proved by uh, Brown and Goga in uh, Joe Gagan in 84. Okay, you can see it's 20 years after uh, the results of Thompson. And then if you jump again almost 20 years, you get more like geometric, or if you want, uh, or I would, I would say more analytical uh, properties. So it was proved by Reznikov in 2001, whoop, in 2001, and independently by uh, Gis, Sergescu, and, uh, and Navas. So if you put together the result, that Thomson group T, so the intermediate one, does not have cash down property T. Okay, so it's not a cash down group. And that was left open for quite a while that like people didn't really know where this group sit in terms of analytical properties. And only two years later, Farley provides a completely different proof that shows that V actually has a Hagoro property. So perhaps I should do like a, a little map of groups to show you how they sit. Uh, so maybe let's do a map of uh, discrete groups. And I should zoom a little bit more. <laughs> so you have a first box that is the finite groups. Okay. Uh, then you have bit bigger, you get the amenable one. Okay. Then you can enlarge a bit more. You have the Hager group, group with the Hager group property. So amenable, I should put some examples. So you have all the abelian one, if you want. You have also anything that is um, Everything that is hyperfinite, so it's like a union of finite groups, let's say. So, for example, a symmetric group that are finitely supported. And in Hager group, you have free product, okay. which is not amenable. And then on the opposite side, you have the cash down group. And so here's a typical example. One typical example with, will be SL3Z, for instance. But the intersection between Kajan and Hager group is very small, is only the finite groups. Okay. So I kind of explain here uh, why the result, in fact, of uh, Farley right here implies the previous one. So in general, if you want to show at something, uh, is not a cash down group, you usually show that it has the high group property and it's not finite. But here, they, they couldn't do that first, yeah, so. They first show that it was not a cash down group, yeah. Okay. And the biggest question that is about this group is to know if F is amenable. Okay, so this is something that is uh, really um, a very difficult open question. And nobody has no idea, you know, about the variety of the statement if it is amenable or not. Like people will think it's more one side or the other. And all the evidence stands that it is in between. Right. So we don't know where is F. F is somewhere here. Okay. We know it has the Hagoro property, but it is not known if it is amenable or not. 
But there are other properties that are weaker than being amenable where it's not known. So it's not known if it is sophic, right? It's not known if it is weakly amenable, so in the sense of calling and high group, right? It's not even known if it is exact, yeah. It's really, really surprising, yeah, till today. Yeah. And I should say that um, in general, anything that has a high group property is weakly amenable. Like it's very hard to construct examples that are in one class but not the other between weakly amenable and high group. Let's say weakly amenable with constant one. So yeah, it's really surprising that it is not known for weakly amenability, weak amenability. And so the nerve of the, of the problem, why we don't know uh, the answer to all of these questions is that we don't understand uh, where the representation of F. Okay. We need more explicit examples of unitary representation of F or more action in general of F to be able to deduce properties of it, okay? All right. Okay. So now what is Jones technology? Well, the Jones technology is something quite um, general. Uh, I'm gonna present it just for the, the Thompson's group because it's how it was discovered and how it's been used mainly until today. Uh, but it's something quite amazing. So you have this Thompson's group S that is extremely complicated that nobody really understand. Uh, but now if I take the construction of von Jones, it tells me that if I consider any category, so I take any category C, so any nice category, let's say, okay. And I take an object in my category, and I consider any morphism that goes, let's say, from A to A tensor A, right? I'm just using like some uh, string diagram. Well, from this data, I can build an action of A. That's really the gift of von Jones is to give us a recipe from a very minimal data uh, to build actions of a very complicated group like Thompson's group. Okay. I'm not giving the detail here, um, but what I'd like to insist, as I was saying before, is that the construction is very explicit. And it takes advantage of a, um, um, a, next, uh, a monoid presentation of Thompson's group. Okay. Well, maybe I, I don't go too much in detail here. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to say also is that this action of the smaller group, so remember we have F inside T inside V, well, often it will extend to T and V, okay, to the larger group. So just a single morphism in a category will give me an action. And so let me just now specify a category and a certain, uh, and a certain tensor product on this category. So for example, you could take the category of field of space. So I'm just gonna fix a Hilbert space, and I'm gonna consider an isometry from H to H tensor H. Okay. An isometry is crucial to it. Well, that will give me a unitary representation. Of Thomson group S, but in fact, I can extend this unitary representation to the larger group Thomson group E. So here an example will be given by um, take H is equal to L2 of N, let's say, and take R of 
something like a delta n, you just put that. Well, this gives you the left regular representation of f. And by slightly modifying this construction to make it a bit more complicated, I would get it for V as well. And what you can do now is that you can actually deform. You could deform the choice of isometry and get a deformation of the less regular representation. So with this, you can, you can obtain less results. So that was actually a construction we did uh, one shown from myself a few years ago. Okay, so let me give you another kind of example. So here I had like the classical tensor product of Hilbert space, but instead of taking the tensor product, I could take the direct sum and it will be translated in the following. Given any two bounded linear operators from H to H satisfying this identity, I have a unitary representation of Thompson group C. Okay, that's something I can just uh, build. Uh, and this is extremely practical uh, technology, so it's really simple to do that. So let me give me give you a key example. Just take H, which is C. It looks very simple, right? Let's take A is equal to B is just multiplying by one over square root of two. This will give you the action well, of V, in fact, yeah, on L two of zero one. Okay. So the Koopman representation of the action I presented before on zero one. So here there is like a Radon Nicodim um, business in order to get like a probability measure preserving action, but you get exactly the Koopman representation. And again, you can deform that and get very interesting representation, in fact. All right, and that was the construction uh, that Von Jones and myself did. And uh, I have some ongoing work on that with one of my students, this shall be Jezena, that I'm gonna present uh, a bit later if I don't go too slow. Okay. Uh, so there are- uh, 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 no, just yeah. a minute. There's a question on chat. If you go back- Oh yeah, sorry. Go back to I the see. previous sheet. Yeah. Uh, what does the space X, Y look like? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's gonna be, um, yeah, so it will depend, of course, on the category you choose. And it's gonna be built as a inductive limit. So it's gonna be built as an inductive limit. And uh, if you know a bit how works the construction of fraction groups, this space can be understood as some kind of uh, fraction as well. So it kind of look like a space of fraction. And in general, this XY should be an element of the category you choose. So here in the example one and two, I'm working in the category of Hilbert spaces. And so this XY is going to be a Hilbert space. If you work, for example, with a um, contravariant functor and your target category is a category of compact space, you will get an action on a compact space at the end of the day. Okay. If you work in the category of vector space, you will get a vector space at the end of the day. Okay. And if I look at another example, maybe here, what happened is that uh, your XY, so your action of Thomson group F is gonna be on a group. Okay. So your XY, if you want, will be an inductive limit of groups there. Yeah. Put your hand on. 
Uh, if I give you something, okay, if you want to have a mental image of this space, you should imagine an infinite binary tree like that, that goes forever. But maybe at some point you stop going forever and you, you plug on top of it some element. Some GI. Okay. And so those GI will, will live in a fixed group. So this is like a fixed group. And so if you look at the collection of all these things, when you have like a finite tree, uh, but you're allowed to go as, as high as you want with on top of the leaves, some decoration coming from a fixed group, that will be uh, your limit, okay? That should be uh, what I wrote, the X, Y. It would be something like that, okay? So you want to look at some decoration of finite trees and you're allowed to, to go as high as you want in terms of trees. Any other question about that? Okay, maybe I should speed up a little bit. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I've been uh, working quite a lot actually is to build the groups uh, with this technology and uh, what I can do is, considering the category of groups, I can just fix one group, gamma. Okay, that's my fixed group. And I take two group morphism, let's say A and B. And from that, I can build an action of the Thompson's group, the larger one, V, on a new group. Okay, so that's a larger group in general. And from this, I can look at the semi-direct product. That is a new group. And we see it here, you get like very interesting construction. Okay, so this is, this is actually very, a very nice group. Right. Maybe I skip the five and six and three and uh, just go on a bit here. Okay, so let me give you at least few analytical properties to show you that this is not, uh, this is actually useful to do something. So first thing, um, remember I show you that you could build the left regular representation with a very simple uh, data, okay? And you could deform it. Well, by deforming it, uh, first we're able to, to reprove uh, the result of Reznikov and Gist, Sarnjusko, and Nava, that these three groups, they are not Kajdan group. Actually, it's already, it was already out of touch, the V, the V case from the work of Reznikov. And uh, using a different proof, actually, uh, we could show that T has the high group property, so slightly better state part. But already, this was a bit more technical than the first one. And the third one, uh, so this was done with, with John. And third one, I could find a proof that actually gives you the high group property. Uh, it was actually uh, quite a gap from the um, from T. Uh, there were no new ideas, I would say, but the technicity was much higher. Yeah. And the thing that we thought would work for from T didn't work. So we had to, to change something. Anyway, this proof was bootstrapped to get something much stronger. It could give you that in fact, the group that I show on the previous slide, okay, so G cross product V when G was like a limit group constructing from a certain, uh, a certain Jones action, you know, on a larger group you could show that this group actually has exceptional diagrammatic properties and using the same proofs than here, you could get new groups that has the high group properties. So this is finally a new theorem. This is finally a new result. Okay. And so the kind of group you get here are, look, they are like a reef products that are obtained from the classical action of V but on the dyadic rationale of the circle. Okay. 
And so I was really happy about that, uh, but I, I thought that for sure this was already known from uh, expert in group theory. And uh, I was very happy that if the Cornule kindly uh, wrote to me to tell me that they were actually uh, the first example of their kind. Okay. So I was very glad to, to know that, yeah. And not also that um, this is, the fact that they have the high group property is independent from the fact that uh, F is amenable or, or not, because here I'm working with a larger Thompson group. It is known to not be amenable. So it will never be, a, never have the high group property for a trivial reason. So that was really nice. That gave us like a new class of example that was out of reach from previous uh, techniques. And I should insist on that by saying that all the previously known proof and example of risk product with the high group property, it was proved using geometrical properties, geometrical proofs. So it was typically, typically proved using a space with walls. Okay. And here it's very different the way you do it. You redo it by building the right matrix coefficient. Okay, so it's really different in essence. All right, so that's a first, uh, first property, first application. Right. So here is some uh, work in progress uh, that is now about building classes of irreducible representation okay. of the Thompson group. As I was saying before, the nerve of the problem, why we don't understand the Thompson group is because we don't have enough explicit example of action and representation. Okay. You want to have plenty of matrix coefficients for testing properties. Okay. So here we have actually a very fun, uh, very fun construction. This is done with Dilshan Vizirdena, uh, one of my students was very gifted actually. And uh, I should say his theorem is really 50 50. Like, uh, Dishan was really put as much input as I put in it. Uh, so, what we have is that take any two by two unitary complex matrix. Well, from this, uh, we can build a Jones representation, all right, with one of those Pythagorean representations we saw before. It turns out they are whole, all of them are irreducible. And moreover, they are irreducible for the smaller group, which is the hardest, hardest case to get. Okay. Moreover, you can show that they are all the time pairwise inequivalent. Okay. So that's really nice. So we have an infinite family. And here I'm saying almost all the time, there are like few cases you need to be careful, but basically you always get something different. Okay. And finally, we don't want to get something that is induced by something finite dimensional. Okay. So you can check that when M is non-diagonal, it's a non-diagonal, non-anti-diagonal matrix, this is never isomorphic to something induced by something finite dimensional. So we get something new interesting. And the way it is done is by deforming, deforming some, um, actually some uh, quasi-regular representation. Okay. So this is done using the formalism of, formalism of Jones. And it is so flexible that you can deform basically anything you want. And by doing this deformation, we get that everything is interesting and they're all different from each other. So we get like some nice continuous path of representation. So let me give you some previously known uh, example. So there are some known uh, connection between the Kuhn's algebra and representation of the Thompson's group. And that was, uh, I believe done by Nekrashevich uh, but more than 15 years ago. And it was recently used by um, uh, Barata and Pinto, Erujo and Pinto to construct, um, I mean, not to construct, but to show that families of representation of the Thompson group are irreducible, okay? Also, I should uh, insist uh, that here, this is more about um, 
uh, but Thompson Group B. He, uh, I believe the results are not known for F. Yeah, but I'll be happy if someone correct me about that because I, I'll be happy to know. Uh, there is another work that's been done for irreducible augmentation, and it was done by Gap Gan Karek, and this is about deforming uh, this representation. Okay. So here, actually, you will take advantage of the fact that this action is not measure preserving on zero one, and you have a radon nicodym uh, rescale, and you're going to multiply your radon nicodym rescale by uh, you're going to put like power i s with s is real number and I'll give you a bunch of new representation and actually they are all uh, pairwise non-isomorphic non and they are also um, irreducible and it was further uh, uh, used utilized this, this concept by Oleson in his PhD thesis with uh, Ufo Aguro yeah. and finally the only other example of irreducible representation that I know, families uh, that I know, uh, is coming from beautiful work of Von Jones, uh, very recent, so only two years ago. So this is like, it's hard to do like a nicer theorem than that. So what did Jones is that uh, for any delta in its famous range of index, index for subfactors, He consider a, um, a tensor category, okay, that is generated by one trivalent vertex. So, and using this trivalent vertex, he builds the representation of the Thompson group, and it turns out they are all irreducible, and they are all pairwise non-isomorphic. So, he gets like a family of irreducible representation indexed by his famous range of subfactors. So this is really beautiful, yeah, yeah. And that was really recent. And again, this is done with his own technology, of course. Uh, but I should insist that this is actually very different from the construction we have. The ones that, that are done with fusion categories are kind of different from the one you build with um, those bonded linear operators on high spaces. spaces. Yeah. Okay, I guess probably uh, I'm gonna stop very soon. It's already 10 to um, maybe one thing I'd like to, um, um, I'd like to, to say is that with this technology, there's something that I've been working on almost exclusively in the last two, three years. And I really enjoy doing that actually, is that with this technology, you can construct new groups okay. that have remarkable properties. And remarkable properties, well, they have exceptional diagrammatic properties, okay? Description of the element. And with that, you can do many things. And so among other, as a, I was citing this result, you can prove high group property. And um, this group actually, some of them have been studied by other group of people that I would like very much to, to talk with. Uh, there is a construction due to Witzel and Zaremski that is called, called cloning system of groups, uh, which is a generalization of something, is, which is, an, a way to abstract a very nice construction of Matt Brin of the Brady Thompson group. Okay. And this is very known in Thompson's group community. Uh, turns out that many of their group can be done with the technology of drones and vice versa. Okay. There are some similarities, although the construction in a sense are different. But it means also that their, their results about like exceptional finiteness properties that they have, which is very strong, done by them and also by Tanushevsky, I should, I forgot to cite. You get them for free for this kind of groups you have for them that are done with Jones technology. So there is a nice back and forth. And things that are kind of obvious with Jones technology are not for the cloning system and vice versa. So there is a very beautiful interplay 
that I think should be really dig into uh, now by people working on, on the Thompson group. I think it can be very interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I guess it's already 8.50. I say I'm happy to, to stop now and I, I thank you for your attention. All right, let me just put back my video. Oh. Thanks very much.